Welcome everybody, everybody to this session. Our topic is micropollutants from wastewater and we want to discuss the whole way from the problem identification up to the solutions. We have uh, various speakers from Switzerland and Netherlands. Um, I think we can each introduce ourselves when we present, but just shortly, um, I'm rather from the surface um, water monitoring part. We have Alin, who is a, an expert in, in treatment technologies for Switzerland. We have Eric Rusink. I'm excusing myself for not being able to pronounce Dutch names correctly. <laughs> perfect, perfect. Uh, he's from a company which produces treatment technologies, if I understood correctly. And we have Martin Nederlof from a water board, also dealing with treatment of wastewater treatment plants. So could I have next slide? We, our idea today is that you may hear a, a few inputs um, on these topics. And finally, we'd like to discuss with you several questions. Of course, you can ask uh, understanding questions, but also questions on how to deal with these topics. I will first present what we consider a problem with these micropollutants from wastewater treatment plants. Then very short input that it's not always possible to do the, the technology end of pipe, but that we also should consider solutions at source. And we have an input on elimination at the treatment plant by Eric, and also additional treatment techniques by Martin. And then uh, Alin will take over the, the, the part what is needed more from the governance side. How can you motivate or um, a country or a region to implement what is needed to implement such such technologies? Um, with that, I would head on to what is actually the problem. Next slide, please. So the, the question is, if we release treated wastewater, does it actually affect our organisms in surface waters or, or harm groundwater sources? Next slide, please. The problem is that we usually don't see whether whether um, water has micropollutants in it. This is a, an, a sample from our close river next to our research institute. And there are quite a, a number of micropollutants in it, but we don't see it. Next slide. So the question is which chemicals pose a threat and how do we assess them? We live in chemical times. The EU knows that they have more than 30,000 chemicals which are used or produced in more than one ton. Most of them probably also in Holland or Switzerland or any other country. The question is, are all these 30,000 chemicals a problem or which one do we have to put our focus on? So I usually go ahead and, and think which ones are um, produced to bio biologically impact or even to kill organisms. So if that's the purpose of a compound, it's already um, more of concern. And then the next is the typical chemical environmental assessment. Is the compound toxic? Is it persistent? Is it likely to be in water? And is it used in high amounts? So that that these four informations give me an information on, the, on whether I expect an impact on the environment. Next slide, please. If we go over the whole range of micropollutants, I do consider pesticides as some of the most harmful ones because they are uh, intended to kill. They have a biological action, which is, is the purpose of their use. Then some of them are very toxic. Some of them are more persistent. Some of them are in water and some of them are used in high amounts. But that, that varies, right, with the, the kind of pesticide. And just right next to it comes the pharmaceuticals, be the antibiotics, painkillers, contrast media. They also have an intended um, effect on organisms. That's why we use them for. So they are also of concern or we should have a closer look. And that's actually the group which is the most problematic ones from wastewater treatment plants. Next to these ones, we have the other remaining around 20, 25,000 chemicals. And of course, there are others which pose a problem, be it perfluorinated organic compounds or other ones. Some are not a big problem like artificial sweeteners. We have them everywhere, but they are most likely not a big problem. Next slide, please. 
So, um, oh, here this is animated. That was a bad idea. <laughs> you have to do a lot of work, Roy. So the question is, do micro pollutants really pose a threat to our organisms, especially fish or liked, I think in many countries. Um, if we consider wastewater treatment plant, we have to consider chronic threat because the chemicals are coming throughout the year so that the animals are exposed really over a long time. Um, next to the micro pollutants in rivers, we have many other problems. Maybe you could click a few times, Roy. High temperatures, um, monotonous environment, we have parasites. We have non-natural non hydrology. If we have dams in Switzerland, that's a big issue. And then next, please. And we have invasive species. So if we're in rivers, it's usually very difficult to prove that actually the wastewater treatment plant is causing problems. These are need really in-depth um, studies, research studies to prove that. And I just want to show you one study that could actually prove an impact. I think there are many, but I just want to raise your awareness that it's not so easy to prove that. So next slide, please. Um, that's the example. Here the group studied fish upstreams and downstreams from, from rivers from a wastewater treatment plant. And the result was that the treated, the treated wastewater actually does show an impact on the local fish. What you see here is that upstream the genetic expression of vitellogenin, it's a word hard to pronounce, in juvenile males males is very low and that's that's a protein which is actually um, used to produce eggs so it's hormone active and it's something usually female fishes need and not um, male fish and you can see that upstreams these fish really have a low concentration of, of that um, protein and downstream they do have a higher uh, vitellogen in production of this protein it's most likely that the hormone active substances which are still in the treated wastewater cause this effect. And um, it's not only on the genetic expression that this can be observed, but some studies could really show that the young male fish actually started producing eggs. So that's something um, we don't want usually in the environment. Next screen, please. Um, I can just give you a short input on how it looks in Switzerland. We have a national surface water monitoring. We do that in roughly 33 rivers and we assess around 60 to 100 micropollutants. It's about two thirds we look at pesticides and one third at pharmaceuticals and other compounds. So in Switzerland, we have uh, almost none of these rivers that we assessed achieves legal requirements, sometimes during the whole year. For the pesticides, it's usually smaller rivers which have a problem spring to autumn. And in, with pharmaceuticals, we actually have some rivers which are red the whole year, um, which are above the threshold the whole year. I think the, the, the problem, the substance that's causing the problem, diclofenac, is now also considered for European Union to be um, added to the priority substances. So I guess uh, EU will also get the problem with that substance. Next slide, please. Where are the problems to be expected? I have here a map of Switzerland. We have about half of the country's mountains above 1000 meter sea level. There we have no problems because we have neither agriculture nor urban settlements. But as soon as you come down to the mainlands, we have uh, widespread agriculture problems. And we also have uh, urban areas. And we could see from the data that if we have more than 20% of conventionally treated wastewater in surface waters, then we have exceedances of, of the legal aspects of diclofenac mainly. So we, we use, usually look at this um, proportion of treated wastewaters in our surface waters, and that gives us a good hint where we expect problems. Next slide, please. Um, on the other hand, I now talked a lot about surface waters, but we also consider groundwater. And there we also, we already find um, artificial sweeteners or pharmaceuticals. So there's also some problem. Next slide. 
So that was my short overview on the what could be the problems. Um, I will give you a very short introduction at solutions at source, and then we go on to the elimination at the treatment plan. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I think it's very important that we also raise awareness in households what chemicals are used and which ones are problematic. I think the households are using pharmaceuticals, pesticides, cleaning products. And in Switzerland, we nowadays have two homepages which try to give tricks and, and advices on how to use chemicals and also what's the correct way of disposing them. I think a big problem is still on how to distribute this information and that people are actually aware. I'm, I'm not sure how we can succeed in that. Then the next slide. Uh, industry and trade. There are also many um, projects are going on in Switzerland because um, the we became more aware that if the, the state of the art technology is used, also industry and trade inputs can be reduced. And also we have a monitoring station at the Rhine, which is um, screening for substances. And sometimes that also allows to give some feedback to industry saying, hello, here we have tons of a compound. And then these inputs can be reduced. Next slide, please. Yeah, that was the very short input on solutions at source. I think this uh, could be extended. Maybe we have also some um, listeners which are more experts in that than myself. And with that, I ask you to um, keep your questions or note them. And I think we will go now through the, all the presentations. And at the end, we have time for questions and discussions. And with that, I would like to give to Eric. Uh, maybe you could also shortly introduce yourself and then... Present. Yeah. Oh, yeah. With pleasure, Irene. Yeah. My name is indeed Eric Roosink, and that next to an entrepreneur, uh, CTO and the founder of NX Filtration. I'm also a part-time professor at the University of Twente, which was not completely well spelled. And uh, the University of Twente is world famous because of membrane technology, and also the technology I want to present as a breakthrough solution dealing with micropollutants is developed starting in 2013 on the University of Twente. Um, on the first slide, um, can we have the next slide? Yeah, okay. L let me highlight here, um, uh, you mentioned, Irene, that you consider this, at least you mentioned it as an end of pipe solution. I really like to emphasize, no, don't, don't blame you, but uh, I'd like to emphasize that I see it more as an integration in the traditional municipal wastewater treatment stations, which are meant to be removal of nutrients and not originally designed to remove micropollutants. So I see it more from my perspective as an integration of, of additional technology to have a wastewater treatment station that does the job where it should do, remove everything which is necessary to depose in the environment. On the next station, you see, next slide, you see that I, I want to put my um, re, new technology. Next slide, please. I want to, to to, to see the removal of micropollutants and, and the introduction of my technology in the whole perspective of global water uh, issues, global issues on water scarcity, on water pollution, all related to climate change, how actual, because our colleagues in Glasgow are now debating on how to, uh, to get the global warming down to an acceptable level. And also we can play with our technology in, in, in that claim. Uh, and I, Please see here, and we know it already, but I want to highlight it, that only 2% of the wastewater is treated, in, is reused in Europe. And worldwide, it's even very, very, very worse. So please see biological treated wastewater as an enormous important source for making high quality water for the industry, but also for drinking water. In the Netherlands, for example, we do have more reuse, we have more effluent than we, have, than we need in drinking water. So we should really focus on that. But then we have to do something with micropollutants, as you already pointed out, uh, Irene. On the next slide, uh, I, I give you a, a brief highlight on where the situation is. I think you did it perfectly already. The challenges we already addressed. And, and I want to focus the, the solutions, the technical solutions on, on membrane technology. We do have ultrafiltration already in the field, but that's still open. It's not suitable to remove low molecular weight organics. We have a reverse osmosis that can do it, but it's too tight. And then we're getting in, in trouble with energy consumption, pretreatment, and chemical use. 
and it means it's time to, to, to come up with a better solution. Uh, sorry, next to membranes, we also, but that is also the subject of, of, uh, of Martin. We also have uh, technologies like uh, oxidation, ozonization, UV peroxide. We've activated carbon uh, for adsorption. And in, 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 in my opinion, these have all the advantages, but also the drawbacks. Certainly why I will focus on the fact that in my opinion, in our opinion, we need a technology that also enables reuse of effluent and is removing the micropollutants. The next slide is then taking you a little bit in the technology. This is the so-called spiral wound configuration flat sheets, which is used for spiral wound reverse osmosis, nanofiltration. It's a perfect system for, for a product for uh, seawater desalination. It can also treat fresh waters, uh, but it does need uh, quite an intensive pretreatment like microfiltration or ultrafiltration that that meets makes this solution relatively complex high energy consumption high chemical consumption so we have come up with annex filtration with a solution based on capillaries which you see on the next click and there you see the solution in uh, in hollow fibers there is no need for pretreatment the membranes are developed that way that Minerals will pass the membrane and that micropollutants, say in general, low molecular weight organics, like the pesticides, the medicines, and also the PFAS, which I will highlight later, will be retained. So your product is a high quality water, which you can use for industrial and you can even further treat it towards drinking water. On the next slide, you see, in fact, here uh, very quickly high over the technology in, in a nutshell. So left, you see membrane modules, which are typically uh, tubular products with a length of one meter fifty. Uh, one such tube produces between thousand and two thousand cubic meters, or uh, sorry, liters. So one or two cubic meters per hour, for the price of twenty or thirty cents. That means extremely much lower price than a bottle of uh, mineral water. You see the product, which is a hollow fiber membrane, very poor responsive structure. And what annex filtration did, they've developed a special new porous structure and a coating layer, which enables to remove the micropollutants, but does allow passage of minerals. On the next slide. Can we have the next slide? There, the the, the, the so-called sustainability is highlighted. Uh, I want to highlight that annex filtration with this breakthrough technology technology managed to go to the stock market in June uh, very successfully. And we were the first green IPO, so the first green membrane company, uh, water-related company, because our production is very green, very energy efficient, but also our products are very energy efficient. So nanofiltration products compared with spiral wound RO or with ultrafiltration, if you take, them for, take one of our elements for five years producing 50,000 cubic meter of water will save then compared to our own 60,000 kilowatt hours in five years and four tons of chemicals, which, which make our technology extremely green. And, and next to the CO2 consumption for one cubic meter of water we are producing with our modules, we need only 60 gram of CO2 equivalents per cubic meter, which is extremely efficient compared to even traditional technologies, as we will see later in this presentation. Next slide. Uh, here we, we go back to, uh, to the situation. So this technology can be integrated in, in, in municipal treatment uh, station. Uh, here you see the, the, the public, so the, the, the effluent from, from municipal treatment station. You can also do it in, in the industry. industry. And, and here it's next to removal of micropollutants. So, so cleaning up and, and saving the environment also to produce high quality water for all kinds of application. In the next slide, you see typically some of the uh, typical results. Uh, that means I think also Diclofenac is in this situation uh, where we have a, re a regention of over 90%. So we can use our technology also perfectly in Switzerland, Irene, as you can see on this, on this picture. And some smaller ones uh, will pass the membrane and they sometimes also pass the, 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 the so-called reverse osmosis membrane and even sometimes adsorption technology have difficulties with this. So a very high efficiency for micropollutants in general, also meeting the requirements uh, of possible new regulation coming up very soon, we all hope. On the next slide. You see here some examples. So here, this is uh, published in the Netherlands already a couple of years ago, uh, where we also use here this technology, our nanofiltration technology, 
Uh, and then we take a sand filter as a pretreatment. Uh, whether that's necessary or not is a discussion, but okay, here we took a sand filter. Then we take an uh, advanced oxidation UV peroxide afterwards to polish the permeate. And with that already relatively extended technology, we do need between 50 and 60 euro cent per cubic meter. So we can produce a very high near to drinking water quality for very acceptable price level. On the next slide, or the next push of the, the click of the bottom, you see this price level. Okay, next, please. Then you see our very low energy consumption right, compared to uh, the, the comparable uh, technology like ozone or activated carbon or even ultrafiltration. RO. Certainly, the difference between reverse osmosis ultrafiltration combination is remarkable. So our energy consumption is in the same area of magnitude as the conventional Exorption or exudation compounds. And we do offer a much lower CO2 footprint. Next slide. So this is also to highlight that, that, that the, the new upcoming uh, emerging compounds, PFAS, is, is retained to a very, very high level, both with our very open nanofiltration membrane, the AT, which is the grayish sparse, but also the, the most dense, of course, has the highest retention rate. So we also fully equipped and ready for all kind of PFAS applications issue, which are popping up very quickly now in the Western part of the Europe and I think even worldwide. So we're ready for removal of PFAS. Next slide. Yeah, there is some, some comparison. This is a comparison we have uh, performed with the Dutch Institute Key WR. Dutch Water Institute here, we, our products are compared with spiral wound from, from uh, ESNA, which is hydronautics. And then you see uh, that our products do compare perfectly also with smaller molecules with uh, the spiral wound nanofiltration, just to see uh, that we in the same level, though we offer all these advantages of uh, footprints, no pretreatment, no chemicals, etc. Next cl click, please. Yeah, and here you see also that uh, compared to, to, to spiral wound, we also have a very high retention for PFAS, here restricted to PFOA and all the well-known uh, selecti selection of upcoming compounds. The next one. Yeah, that's a highlight of, of all the things I, I told and some of the things I forgot. So I mentioned to you about the operational cost. We can produce clean water for the price between 20 and 30 euro cents per cubic meter. Compare that for 1,000 liter with a bottle of mineral water. And then also we clean up the environment. Energy consumption is very low. CO2 consumption which is not mentioned here and just is reported by the Stockholm report in 2019, 60 gram CO2 uh, equivalents per, per cubic meter. We hardly use chemicals, a lot of physical cleanings, highly reliable for lock removal yeah, because next to all the micropollutants, we also have microplastics, nanoplastics. We have this uh, antimicrobial resistant bacteria, which of course we also remove from the water, viruses. It's backwashable. Our membranes can be cleaned very uh, thoroughly with, with chloridine if necessary. So I think we have a, a perfect new step in, to be integrated in, in wastewater treatment stand and then make them completely suitable for the future and also bring us a better, better environment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric, very much for this, this introduction to this new technology or, or from my point of view, new maybe for the expert, it's not. Um, I'm happy that we now can have Martin Nedelov presenting from the view of a, of a water board from app, um, application. And I think, Roy, could you um, unmute Martin? Somehow his microphone is still muted and he cannot unmute it himself. <laughs> No, not yet. No. Roy, do you have any possibility to do that? No, I cannot <coughs> unmute him. So, okay. Uh, Can I that as a moderator? No. No. Maybe if he refresh the, this step, then he can join again. You mean go Something. completely out of no, yeah, just on the le top left, click on the, uh, click on the uh, refresh button. And then uh, maybe or if, if you go to the oh I don't know in English Zahnrad. <laughs> oh. I think then we take Alin first. So yeah, we have time to get Martin back. Martin is there. Ah, good. 
Can you? Yes. 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 There he is. Wow. <laughs> Thank you, Ron. Good luck. Technical yeah. advice. So, next challenge is to get my presentation on the screen. I think that's Roy who can present. Or Roy, do you have Martin's presentation? Roy is our technical guy. I will gonna share right now. So. Okay, then you don't uh, have to do anything, seconds. Martin. <laughs> Thanks, Roy. Thank you very much indeed. I don't see my presentation yet. There it is. Okay, thank you. And I'm sorry for the technical problems, but finally it works. So, uh, Eric, thank you very much on your uh, presentation on membrane technology. Uh, I'm sorry to say that uh, membrane technology is not applied yet for the removal of pharmaceuticals in wastewater treatment plants in the Netherlands but I will explain what's going on in the Netherlands. Uh, next slide, please. Probably that's my uh, title page, yes. So uh, my short talk is about the reduction of uh, micropollutants in domestic wastewater with a focus on the removal of pharmaceuticals. And I'm presenting it, uh, this, uh, I'm working at the water board AMAS in the Netherlands and I'm program manager of a national implementation program of additional steps for the removal of pharmaceuticals. Next slide, please. Yes, a, a few words about the source approach maybe because the introduction was very short by uh, Irene. <laughs> so maybe I can uh, add a little thing. So we have um, in the Netherlands what we call the Dutch approach. So that's a chain approach for pharmaceuticals in water, starting with um, so the, uh, starting with the development and authorization of new pharmaceuticals via prescription and use by uh, the pharmacies and, and the doctors, and of course uh, the waste uh, wastewater and sewage treatment. And we are of the opinion in the Netherlands that uh, water boards are, should not forbid the use of pharmaceuticals in general, because they are meant to uh, have a contribution for public health. But um, having said that, uh, when pharmaceuticals are used uh, for, uh, of, when pharmaceuticals are not effective, then, then you should limit the use. So the Voltaren example is a famous example for that. And in addition, uh, pharmaceuticals that are not used should be brought back to the, to the pharmacy. Uh, that will reduce uh, the emissions for, I think I'm afraid, for a small part. So that should be done. But uh, in the end, uh, pharmaceuticals will end up in our wastewater and some kind of treatment will be necessary. So in, in general, it is both a source approach and both uh, anti end of pipe, but especially for pharmaceuticals, we think that uh, an end of pipe treatment is still necessary. For a number of industrial components, that might be another case, uh, for instance, for PFAS and that kind of stuff, uh, a source approach uh, is, is to be preferred, I think. So that's uh, a few words about the source. So the, um, in the Netherlands, we have um, we have done uh, what we call a hotspot analysis. So based on uh, a model calculation, we did an inventory on all uh, 314 wastewater treatment plants we have in the Netherlands. And it appeared that um, for about 100 wastewater treatment plants, there is a significant effect on water quality, either because of uh, the ecotoxicity in the receiving surface water or that it threatens uh, drinking water sources. So um, we have about 100 hotspots in the Netherlands that, uh, uh, that are possible candidates for 
uh, the implementation of additional treatment technologies. Next slide, please. So in the Netherlands, we have um, a national implementation program that's partly financed by the Ministry of Infrastructure and Water Management. They have a budget of 60 million euros. Uh, that sounds as a lot of money, but it's only a part of the total cost of all those additional treatment plants. At this moment, and again, sorry, Eric, uh, we use um, as proven technologies for the removal of pharmaceuticals and other organic micropollutants, we use ozone oxidation. There are the red dots in this picture. And we use uh, activated carbon uh, applications, either powdered or granular. And uh, maybe the combination of both is, is a nice way, way to go. Um, so as an example of uh, the water, uh, water board I'm working, um, so we have uh, uh, seven wastewater treatment plants in our area, and we uh, chose those wastewater treatment plants that are both have an effect on the local water quality uh, and have an effect on the quality of the river Maas, uh, which is used in the Netherlands as a source for drinking water. So we picked our own hotspots and we did some extra uh, chemical analysis to confirm that uh, these wastewater treatment plants are indeed uh, the hotspots uh, we are looking for. Next slide. Uh, yeah, this is our area with the red dots. Uh, you can see that, that the river A uh, uh, yeah, there's out, some wastewater treatment plants discharge their effluent on a small river that end up in the river mass. Next slide. Yes. So we have um, decided to uh, implement a PARCAS installation at wastewater treatment plant Oyen. And PARCAS that stands for powdered activated carbon directly dosed in the active sludge uh, system. And um, a year later, we will uh, implement a demonstration installation with uh, PARCAS in combination with ozone, because we believe that the combination of powdered activated carbon and ozone oxidation will remove a broad spectrum of different kind of organic micropollutants. So we will check and prove that in uh, in practice we're still thinking of a third location and that's to be decided so uh, the next uh, conference uh, more news about that um, yes so we consider uh in in the netherlands in in the implementation program uh, the powdered activated carbon, the active carbon filtration, and the ozone uh, oxidation as proven technologies. They differ in, in removal of uh, organic micropollutants. They differ in costs. Um, as mentioned already, a challenge in the Netherlands, but I think all uh, other countries as well, is when you apply additional treatment steps, uh, your climate footprint will increase and water bores water boards have also a goal uh, of reducing their climate footprint. So there are uh, discussions that are being held in water boards, what is the right thing to do. Um, in the Netherlands, uh, uh, bromate uh, standard is coming up. So at this moment, uh, uh, a discussion is going on uh, if ozone is a suitable technology to implement. And again, probably uh, a combination with carbon so that you can reduce your ozone dosage and therefore reduce your bromate formation might be uh, an efficient way uh, to go. Um, as mentioned already by Eric, um, yeah, depending on the technology you choose, you might remove other components as well. So with filtration techniques, you might remove some of the nutrients. Uh, ozone might have the advantage of uh, some disinfection. So and that's the way we are looking at that, that uh, it might be attractive to 
combine the removal of pharmaceuticals with other uh, water quality challenges. Next slide. So uh, we have an, an innovation program as well, um, led by uh, the Dutch research organization STOA, in which we um, investigate um, other techniques such as membrane filtration, such as more natural treatments, um, uh, sorry, I have to do the next slide, please. Um, so, so membrane filtration is one of the candidates um, and uh, the concentrate challenge is there. So uh, the, the, the components that are removed end up in the concentration in the concentrate, which you should have a destination for that. So I think there is a lot of opportunities to implement uh, new technologies that are better than the present ones. And uh, I must say that we are piloting the technology of uh, Eric as well at one of, at one of our wastewater treatment plants. So, uh, uh, so the challenges for the near future is, um, and, and that's the, the numbers we use as a reference. So you can see that especially the granular, granular active carbon has a very high CO2, CO2 footprint and is uh, relative uh, expensive compared to the other ones. Um, and the removal of pharmaceuticals, uh, which is a, a, a condition for uh, the financial contribution of the ministry, differs between uh, the different technologies, not as much as the total uh, removal because we have a, uh, yeah, a condition that seven out of 11 indicator uh, pharmaceuticals should be removed, but the technologies differ in which components they remove efficiently. Uh, efficiently. So maybe indeed a new technology or a combination of present technologies uh, is the way to go. So that's uh, in brief my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Martin. I ask all the listeners to, to think about questions. We'll listen now to Alin and afterwards we'll head into the discussion. Alin, so it would be nice if you could present your presentation. Or Roy, you again. Yeah. Um, I work for the Swiss Water Association. Hi, everybody. Um, we are like a platform that does consulting for process engineering. So uh, we are a knowledge platform for engineers, authorities, um, researchers to get all the technical uh, knowledge uh, flowing. Um, next, please. So I will talk about implementation. I will show you what was necessary in Switzerland to implement a national strategy uh, to upgrade the treatment plants. Here see, you see an example of an ozonation plant with gag filtration as a post-treatment. Uh, post Next, please. So um, at the beginning, the very beginning, there were several international research studies and then there was a project, Micropol, and um, it was based on a lot of pilot studies. Um, this is the report you see in the middle. It's very important. I use it very often, even 10 years later. Um, so the, there, everything is um, written down, what is necessary, um, what works, what doesn't work, uh, what does it mean for Switzerland, uh, how much does it cost, everything about energy consumption, infrastructure, um, change. Um, yeah, I think that's a very good basis for all the work that follows. And then um, there were a lot of other pilot tests, uh, as you see one example on the right side. Um, so just to show the feasibility of the technologies. So I think the, it is very necessary to involve 
relevant stakeholders in the whole political process um, that this finally works out. So um, in Switzerland, the engineers, the authorities, uh, researchers, plan operators, they work together. So they all could uh, be a bit Pauline? part of the... Yep. Can I shortly interrupt you? Your voice is not so fluent. Maybe you switch off the, the camera. Or do the others have that problem too? Do you yeah, me? okay. Sorry, maybe you try again. Sorry for interrupting. Okay, now. I think it's better, yeah, try. Uh, so, um, yeah, the relevant stakeholders in the legislative process. Um, that's also why our platform was founded. I know it's not better. I'm very sorry. Maybe you also have to reconnect, or or um. Is it not better now? No. Disconnect oh, no. the connection to the server of Airwag. That was my problem. <laughs> Can you hear me better now? Hmm. So, uh, try again. Uh, yeah, do you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry. Please. <laughs> Um, okay, so the next slide would uh, show the political process. It started in 2006 um, with this uh, strategy Macropole. And then, um, yes, yeah, next slide. Um, uh, there was a proposal for a change in the ordinance. Um, this was uh, highly welcomed by the um, uh, population, but they so, said um, we need a financial uh, solution. So, um, yeah, who's going to pay? That was important to elaborate this. Um, so, um, in 2012, it was proposed to change the law that was necessary for this financial um, solution. Um, that was also highly accepted. And so, um, uh, the parliament uh, um, voted for this um, law change and accepted it by 75%. That's quite high for, for Switzerland. Um, so in 2016, it came into force, um, this new law that was the basis for the whole um, upgrade of the treatment plants. Next, please. I think um, very important is to have clear and pragmatic framework conditions. So to simplify the problem, because it's so complicated, there are so many substances. And then, yeah, just do something. So um, in Switzerland, we have three aims to protect water, um, protect the sensitive water bodies, um, quality control of drinking water sources, and load reduction. So this means that um, with these three aims, um, 135 to 180 plants out of 800 that we have in total will be upgraded. So it's only there where it makes most sense. Um, the reduction goal is 80% in Switzerland, and we measure only 12 substances as a, like a, um, uh, indicator substances to um, show that we also can uh, eliminate a broad range of substances. That is our overall goal. Um, so next slide, please. I will just show you the financing solution. Um, so um, it, it's kind of a polluter pays principle. Every plant has to pay nine Swiss francs or eight euros per people that is connected per year into a fund. And from this fund, um, the new measurements, new treatments are paid um, so for the plants that are upgraded. And as soon as they have a functioning treatment, they don't have to pay the tax anymore. Next slide, please. 
Um, so to sum up, it was um, crucial for the Swiss national strategy um, that it is based, um, yeah, sound, uh, that it has a sound scientific and technical basis, that it uh, is highly accepted by society and also that the political process is, um, um, yeah, where everybody, everybody is involved. Then um, it's technically feasible, it's manageable. So we have a very easy monitoring system that also works. So we have now a few years of experience. Um, it's very pragmatic and it's adaptable. Well, I forgot to say that we have um, 20 years um, time to um, that the process can change. So in 2040, um, all the selected treatment plants should be upgraded. Um, yeah, and it's financially feasible. Here you see on the left and uh, the right side a map with our actual situation. So we have 14 plants running. Um, some of them are uh, ozonation with sun filtration. Some of them are packed processes, some granular activated carbon and some combinations. And the other dots are projects like in, in the planning or construction phase. Uh, yeah, and with the next slide, I want to um, end. Um, here you see the treatment plant, a treatment plant with pack dosage, sedimentation, and sound filtration. And uh, yeah, works well. Thanks. Thank you. Technology working on. Questions in in um, also ask to be participation. Cool. Maybe we started that uh, and our problem because groundwater technologies are available. Yes, the membrane technology. And we saw from Ali what was necessary in Switzerland, maybe in the implemented technologies. Um, you can hear me in the Your, your um, how do you call it? Um, yeah, question from the people in um, through me. Maybe I ask to be part of the group have um, questions. No questions. Can I make a remark then, uh, Irene? Please. Yeah, I don't know whether you can hear me well. Your voice is also sometimes going up and going down. Uh, but um, perhaps it, it, it's important uh, in the discussion we already started with, with, with Martin and, and, and Martin was highlighting indeed the activated carbon and, and the ozonization uh, activities in order to reduce the amount of micropollutants, which of course is completely true. Um, but I think, again, I want to highlight the fact that indeed um, membrane infiltration does offer uh, all these advantages next to removing micropollutants, also the viruses, the bacteria, the anti resistance, so the particles, so producing a very high quality of water. Uh, Martin mentioned also that concentrate is something to, to is, 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 is a negative point in, 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 in the membrane filtration. And yes, uh, um, uh, we, we, I, I'm next to an entrepreneur and, and, and a professor, but, but also we're working for, closely together with a lot of other groups in the Netherlands and universities. We have a big NWO pro, program, also Professor Ibrainas, I saw he's in the audience. So together with, with this groups and, and other groups, we are investigating, uh, I think a very 
efficient way of dealing with concentrate in this application by sending it back to the sewer. So the concentrate of the nanofiltration, which does contain a high concentration of micropollutants, if you send that back to the, say, somewhere to the beginning of the sewer, then you enhance further degradation, you enhance possible absorption to the sludge. With sludge removal, you can burn it. That means with sending back the concentrate of the nanofiltration, you can really integrate nanofiltration technology into existing sewer systems, dealing also with the concentrate. And yes, Martin is fully right. It's not demonstrated yet on, on full scale. That's why we're really eager to take that step. But on all a small scale, for example, in the Institute of Wetsis, we did already studies in the direction that it's a very promising concept to come up with a completely new and complete integrated system in wastewater treatment plants. May I remark on that, Eric? Of course, of course. That's why I opened the floor. <laughs> we will continue the discussion. Uh, so, so I think that's for uh, a lot of components uh, that will work. So you can adapt uh, the microbiology biology in your active sludge system to improve the biological degradation of uh, organic micropollutants. And I'm afraid there are some exceptions. And PFAS is one of them. So PFAS doesn't uh, isn't biodegradable. So uh, and and that's that's uh, they they will accumulate in your in your system. And something you have to think so, uh, about something to re to remove the recalcitrant uh, components still. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I fully agree with you. But there are some. Uh, attention points uh, yeah, absolutely. not yeah. solved yet. Yeah, 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 but PFAS could be a point, but it's it, it's quite hydrophobic, so it might absorb also quite well to the sludge. But one. I leave that to, to, to the, I leave that to the specialist. I'm only yeah, you're right. knowledge, knowledgeable member. <laughs> <laughs> your 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 noise your voice is very bad, Irene. Do you understand? I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. And it says it's do you have to say Martin with Irene? Yeah, I have to say Wiener. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe refresh is helping. Yeah. Can you see my screen? There is one question in the in the chat from Tanya. Chao Han, if I pronounce it correctly. Maybe someone can answer that question. Okay, I'm back. Wow. <laughs> is, it, is it better now? Much better. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It was the refresh button. Yeah, I also wanted to... I, just could hear that you mentioned the question of Tanya Chauhan. Maybe I can try to answer. Oh, I hear um, a back call. Maybe Martin, can you switch off your micro? Yes. Um, uh, the way we select antibiotics at the moment is that we look at the consumption amounts and at the impact on, on e ecotoxicology. So that's how we, we prioritize the, the antibiotics to be monitored, not to be used. I think that's a question of, of medical questions, usually not and the question by the environment. An aspect that we are not considering yet is, is the antibiotic resistance. I think that's a topic that is coming up more and which we don't know yet enough. But maybe Martin also can comment on that. You said that in, in um in Netherlands, you already considered the environment during authorization process. What, what does that mean? Um, I don't completely understand what you say, but um, I think that that uh, antibiotic resistance is uh, an underestimated uh, problem, especially in those uh, areas that, that uh, people are swimming downstream your wastewater treatment plant. Um, so uh, it, it could be the, the case that in the near future, membrane technology kind of uh, things or oxidation kind of things to both remove your antibiotics, so the, the chemical itself and the uh, resistant bacteria in the same way could be necessary at some places. And again, at some hotspots, uh, 
uh, that should be uh, could be a way to go. And there's a lot of research going on at this moment on um, what happens with antibiotic resistance in the wastewater treatment plants and uh, in which amount those antibiotic resistance end up in your surface water. So yeah, that's an upcoming, upcoming issue and, and that's I think one of the challenges we have. So in the Netherlands we focus a bit on, on some pharmaceuticals at the moment but there are other challenges as well. So picking an, a new technology should uh, include as far as possible uh, future challenges as well. But it's not you. You showed this cycle from source to end of pipe, and you said that it's already considered during the authorization process with pharmaceuticals. Uh, no, not yet. Okay, not yet. So, so in the Netherlands, uh, the main focus is on effectiveness for the public health. Yep. And uh, new. Uh, new products are of new uh, manufacturers are obliged to measure the environmental impact, but it is not as not uh, not yet the case that you can use that argument to forbid some pharmaceuticals. That that's a bridge too far. Okay. But it helps that we, as uh, water boards, know what the. Um, characteristics are of mm -hmm. the pharmaceuticals to implement the right technology to remove them. Yeah, that's what's still missing in Switzerland. Thank you for that hint. I think that's um, an important thing uh, as a next step that we know what kind of chemicals are used and what are the characteristics and then you can adapt your uh, retreatment steps and you can also measure the right components. Compounds, so, yeah. yeah. I think we have it for pesticides, but not yet for pharmaceuticals. So they have to follow. Um, we have many questions for Eric and three minutes left. Eric, did, did you see them? We don't, you have to switch on your microphone. Sorry, I answer, I tried to answer, uh, answer already something on, on paper with uh, Fahir Hassan. Oh, now we have the echo on your, maybe you have, do you have the others also a problem with hearing e Eric? Can no. you hear me? Oh. Yeah. Then I let you speak. Sorry. Then it's me. No, no, but um, it, it's interesting. What what question do you refer to, Irene? Is it the question from Jan Peter van der Hoek on concentrate? So he's more or less supporting the idea of sending back the concentrate to uh, to, to the sewer. Yeah, maybe maybe one remark on that, if I'm allowed. Eh? Of course, of course. Uh, well. Making a fast calculation, eh? uh, you, you first produce a concentrate, it's about 20% of a volume, but maybe you have an uh, up concentration of a factor 5, and then you send it back to the influent of the wastewater treatment plant, there again a, a dilution takes place, so the increasing concentration is not that high, I think, in the influent. So the first time it passes the biological wastewater treatment plant, it just passes the treatment plant because it's not biodegraded, such a small increase in concentration, should that result in a biodegradation for a second time? So that's a question, well, I'm not a microbiologist, but the effect of concentration, I'm not sure about it. Just a remark, maybe uh, Hup Reinhardt is uh, also uh, in the audience. <laughs> yeah, knows, maybe. I, I, think, I think we need Hup, you're right. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, it's a fair statement, I think. But what I want to, to um, uh, if I may, also the remark of, of Martin on the PFAS, I think, Yes, uh, it might be an issue for PFAS if we do this uh, this concept. But PFAS, in my perspective, is also, uh, it's, I think, is it not the same also when you work with activated carbon or you work with oxidation? Well, PFAS is really a nasty compound to get rid of. So you, even if you have it on your activated carbon. I fully carbon, agree. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now well, then we're on the same line. And, and, and sorry, I cannot no, I give think, that. I think the PFAS issue, I thought about it. Uh, the only thing is that, that you should absorb it at some component, uh, for instance, uh, powdered activated carbon and burn it at a very, very high temperature. Mm -hmm. and but you have, yeah, sludge, you keep all... sludge incineration systems have too low temperature to even burn your PFAS. Mm -hmm. I see you're in already knocking. So, but let's not try to, de to, to dissolve that. Yeah, 
solving the, the PFAS issue would be a conference topic by itself. And, and, and perhaps a, <laughs> a good yeah. one, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think you're right, Irene. I think you're right. <laughs> so okay. I'm looking at the time. It is yeah, one, one o'clock. I'm happy that so many people joined despite uh, being hungry, probably. Mm -hmm. um, is there any last urgent question? Maybe also from the presenters? Many, but not here now. Well, not here now. So uh, there was a, Thank you, Boris. A, a remark in, in the chat on the uh, collection of pharmaceuticals in Malta. Um, that, that, that pharmacies have special bins for that. And that's the case also in the Netherlands. Uh, so the, the, the not used uh, pharmaceuticals are collected in a proper way. That, that's fairly much arranged in, in the Netherlands, uh, the same as in Malta, I suppose. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's only a very, very small proportion of the chemicals we see in the environment. It's very well we do it, but it's only uh, helping a little bit. Yeah, I think that's an important take home message also that the, the potential to reduce it at source is quite small. Maybe yeah. some with authorization process, having more information on, on environmental impact, also having information on the amounts used that helps us to target what to monitor and how to treat. And then finally, my conclusion is also there are two technologies two or three which are implemented in large scale and, and quite a number of technologies waiting for implementation, which also proved to be or have a potential. And Absolutely. with that, I would like to thank all of the presenters and Roy for handling the technical issues. And I'm excusing myself for the technical problems. I wish you a good afternoon. Well done. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Have a nice day. Bye. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.